Today, we are continuing with the theme of Three Nephi Stories. This is featuring the great champion, a suggestion from one of our readers. First of all, we're going to look at some of the typical attributes of a visit from one of the translated beings. There's often very similar odd characteristics to each story, such as so choice of dress. They're very often not in fashion. They're sometimes decades behind current trends in how they dress. The words they choose to use, their entrances, and especially their exits. They say peculiar things, and they often have a specific purpose. Each story seems to have something important that was accomplished, such as converting someone to the gospel. They seem to be focused on strictly performing the work of the Lord. They're not there to show off or to play games or to just impress. They often are very gentlemanly, but question number four, are they capable of offering a strong warning and a rebuke to those who need it? If you've ever been in the crosshairs of the directional velocity of the voice of one of these men, you would understand you would not want to even look in his direction or see his face. This is the story of the Gray Champion. The excerpts from this story by Nathaniel Hawthorne begin here. One afternoon in April 1689, Sir Edmund Andros and his favorite counselors, being warm with wine, assembled the red coats of the governor's guard and made their appearance in the streets of Boston. The sun was near setting when the march commenced. Though more than sixty years had elapsed since the pilgrims came, this crowd of their descendants still show the strong and somber features of their character, perhaps more strikingly in such a stern emergency than on happier occasions. There was the sober garb, the general severity of mien, the gloomy but undismayed, undismayed expression, the scriptural forms of speech, and the confidence in heaven's blessing on the righteous cause, which would have marked a band of the original Puritans when threatened by some peril of the wilderness. There were grounds for conjecturing that Sir Edmund Andros intended, at once, to strike terror by a parade of military force and to confound the opposite faction by possessing himself of their chief. Stand firm for the old charter governor, shouted the crowd, seizing upon the idea. The good old governor Bradstreet. While this cry was at the loudest, the people were surprised by the well-known figure of Governor Bradstreet himself, a patriarch of nearly ninety, who appeared on the elevated steps of a door and, with characteristic mildness, besought them to submit to the constituted authorities. My children, concluded this venerable person, do nothing rashly, cry not aloud, but pray for the welfare of New England, and expect patiently what the Lord will do in this matter. The event was soon to be decided. All this time the roll of the drum had been approaching through Cornhill, louder and deeper, till, with reverberations from house to house and the regular tramp of martial footsteps, it burst into the street. A double rank of soldiers made their appearance, occupying the whole breadth of the passage, with shouldered matchlocks and matches burning, so as to present a roll of fires in the dusk. Their steady march was like the progress of a machine that would roll irresistibly over everything in its way. Next, moving slowly, with a confused clatter of hoofs on the pavement, rode a party of mounted gentlemen, the central figure being Sir Edmund Andros, elderly, but erect and soldier-like. Those around him were his favorite counselors and the bitterest foes of New England. As you can see from the subheadline, the administration of Sir Edmund Andros lacked scarcely a single characteristic of tyranny. Laws were made and taxes levied without concurrence of the people. At his right hand rose Edward Randolph, our arch enemy, that blasted wretch, as Cotton Mather calls him, 
who achieved the downfall of our ancient government and was followed with a sensible curse through life and to his grave. On the other side was Bullivant, scattering jests and mockery as he rode along. Dudley came behind with a downcast look, dreading, as well he might, to meet the indignant gaze of the people, who beheld him, their only countryman, by birth, among the oppressors of his native land. The captain of a frigate in the harbor and two or three civil officers under the crown were also there. But the figure which most attracted the public eye and stirred up the deepest feeling was the Episcopal clergyman of King's Chapel, riding haughtily among the magistrates in his priestly vestments, the fitting representative of prelacy and persecution, the union of church and state, and all those abominations which had driven the Puritans to the wilderness. Another guard of soldiers in double rank brought up the rear. The whole scene was a picture of the condition of New England and its morale, the deformity of any government that does not grow out of the nature of things and the character of the people. On one side, the religious multitude with their sad visages and dark attire, and on the other, the group of despotic rulers with the high churchmen in the midst, and here and there a crucifix at their bosoms, all magnificently clad flushed with wine, proud of unjust authority, and scoffing at the universal groan, and the mercenary soldiers waiting but the word to deluge the street with blood, showing the only means by which obedience could be secured. O oh, Lord of hosts, cried a voice among the crowd, provide a champion for thy people. This ejaculation was loudly uttered and served as a herald's cry to introduce a remarkable personages. personage. The crowd had rolled back and were now huddled together nearly at the extremity of the street, while the soldiers had advanced no more than a third of its length. The intervening space was empty, a paved solitude between lofty edifices, which threw almost a twilight shadow over it. Suddenly there was seen the figure of an ancient man who seemed to have emerged from among the people and was walking by himself along the center of the street to confront the armed band. He wore the old Puritan dress, a dark cloak, and a steeple-crowned hat in the fashion of at least fifty years before, with a heavy sword upon his thigh, but a staff in his hand to assist the tremendous gait of age. When at some distance from the multitude, the old man turned slowly round, displaying a face of antique majesty, rendered doubly venerable by the hoary beard that descended on his breast. He made a gesture at once of encouragement and warning, then turned again and resumed his way. Who is this great patriarch? asked the young men of their sires. Who is this venerable brother? asked the old men among themselves, but none could make reply. The fathers of the people, those of fourscore years and upwards, were disturbed, deeming it strange that they should forget one of such evident authority, whom they must have known in their early days, the associate of Winthrop, and all the old counselors, giving laws and making prayers and leading them against their foes. The elderly men ought to have remembered him, too, with locks as gray in their youth, as their own were now, and the young. How could he have passed so utterly from their memories, that hoary sire, the relic of long-departed times, whose awful benediction has surely been bestowed on their uncovered heads in childhood? Whence did he come? What is his purpose? Who can this old man be? whispered the wondering crowd. Meanwhile, the venerable stranger, staff in hand, was pursuing his solitary walk along the center of the street. As he drew near the advancing soldiers, and as the roll of their drum came full upon his ear, the old man raised himself to a loftier mien, while the decrepitude of age seemed to fall from his shoulders, leaving him in gray but unbroken dignity. 
Now he marched onward with the warrior's step, keeping time to the military music. Thus the aged form advanced on one side and the whole parade of soldiers and magistrates on the other, till, when scarcely twenty yards remained between them, the old man grasped his staff by the middle and held it before them like a leader's truncheon. Stand, cried he. The eye, the face, and the attitude of command, the solemn yet warlike peal of that voice, fit either to rule a host in the battlefield or be raised to God in prayer, were irresistible. At the old man's word and outstretched arm, the roll of the drum was hushed at once, and the advancing line stood still. A, tremo a, a tremulous enthusiasm seized upon the multitude. That stately form, combining the leader and the saint, so gray, so dimly seen in such an ancient garb, could only belong to some old champion of the righteous cause, whom the oppressor's drum had summoned from his grave. They raised a shout of awe and exultation, and looked for the deliverance of New England. The governor and the gentlemen of his party, perceiving themselves brought to an unexpected stand, rode hastily forward, as if they would have pressed their snorting and affrighted horses right against the hoary apparition. He, however, blenched not a step, but glancing his severe eye round the group, which half encompassed him, at last bent it sternly, on Sir Edmund Andros. One would have thought that the dark old man was chief ruler there, and that the governor and counselor, the council with soldiers at their back, representing the whole power and authority of the crown, had no alternative but obedience. What does this old fellow here? cried Edward Randolph fiercely. Oh, Sir Edmund! Bid the soldiers forward and give them the dotard, the same choice that you give all his countrymen, to stand aside or be trampled on. Nay, nay, let us show respect to the good grandsire, grandsire said Bullivant, laughing. See you not, he is some old round-headed dignitary who hath lain asleep these thirty years and knows nothing of the change of times? Doubtless he thinks to put us down with a proclamation in old Knoll's name. Are you mad, old man? demanded Sir Edward Andros in a lard, in a loud and harsh tone. How dare you stay the march of King James Governor? I have stayed the march of a king himself ere now, replied the grey figure with stern composure. I am here, Sir Governor, because the cry of an oppressed people hath disturbed me in my secret place. And beseeching this favor earnestly of the Lord, it was vouchsafed me to appear once again on earth in the good old cause of his saints. And what speak ye of James? There is no longer a popish tyrant on the throne of England, and by tomorrow noon his name shall be a byword in this very street, where ye would make it a word of terror. Back, thou was a governor back. With this night thy power is ended. Tomorrow the prison. Back, lest I foretell the scaffold. The people had been drawing nearer and nearer, and drinking in the words of their champion, who spoke in accents long disused, like one unaccustomed to converse, except with the dead of many years ago. But his voice stirred their souls. They confronted the soldiers, not wholly without arms, and ready to convert the very stones of the street into deadly weapons. Sir, Ed Sir Edmund Andros looked at the old man. Then he cast his hard and cruel eye over the multitude, and beheld them burning with that lurid wrath, so difficult to kindle or to quench. And again he fixed his gaze on the aged form, which stood obscurely in an open space, where neither friend nor foe, had thrust himself. What were his thoughts? He uttered no word which might discover. But whether the oppressor were overawed by the great champion's look, or perceived his peril in the threatening attitude of the people, it is certain that he gave back and ordered his soldiers to commence a slow and guarded retreat. Before another sunset, the governor and all that rode so proudly with him were prisoners and long ere it was known that James had abdicated. King William, 
was proclaimed throughout New England. But where was the great champion? Some reported that when the troops had the troops had gone from King Street and the people were thronging tumultuously in the rear, Bradstreet, the aged governor, was seen to embrace a four more aged than his own. Others soberly affirmed that while they marveled at the venerable grandeur of this aspect, the old man had faded from their eyes, melting slowly into the hues of twilight, till where he stood there was an empty space. But all agreed that the hoary shape was gone. The men of that generation watched for his reappearance in sunshine and in twilight, but never saw him more, nor knew when his funeral passed, nor where his gravestone was. And who was the great champion? Perhaps his name might be found in the records of that stern court of justice, which passed the sentence too mighty for the age, but glorious in all after times for its humbling lesson to the monarch and its high example to the subject. I have heard that whenever the descendants of the Puritans are to show the spirit of their size, sires, the old man appears again. When 80 years had passed, he walked once more in King Street. Five years later, in the twilight of an April morning, he stood on the green besides the meeting house at Lexington, where now the obelisk of granite, with a slab of slate inlaid, commemorates the first fallen of the revolution. And when our fathers were toiling at the breastwork on Bunker's Hill, all through that night the old warrior walked his rounds. Long, long may it be, ere he comes again, his hour is one of darkness and adversity and peril. But should domestic tyranny oppress us, or the invader's step pollute our soil, still may the great champion come, for he is the type of New England's hereditary spirit, and his shadowy march on the eve of danger must ever be the pledge that New England's sons will vindicate their ancestry. Moving on to other three Nephi stories, there, there's uh, several on YouTube, and this is simply uh, an interesting one of an elderly woman who was in a hospital, and you can search it with uh, the words you see there, the Nephi Mormon testimony. It's a story of uh, a man who mysteriously is appeared in a hospital and blessed them and converted a person in the next room from from this woman. She's got a book out, but unfortunately uh, we can't find a way to order it. Uh, it doesn't seem to be in print anymore. Here's a report of a special visitor to Salt Lake from a young man in the 1950s. On a beautiful midsummer afternoon in about 1952, I was driving south on State Street in Salt Lake City, Utah. As I stopped for the light at 8 South, a tall, slender, dark complexioned man walked in front of my car, causing me to think. There is a man from Mexico who lives with the poor of his people, trying to better their lot, for he loves them. He was wearing working clothes and was obviously a foreigner, such as one can tell of some people from Mexico and the feeling was of a severe poverty of certain places in rural Mexico. I had a powerful feeling come over me that here is a great man who is a leader of his people, and that this man was patiently, calmly, helping his people there, for he loved them. The next thought I had was, he is the Savior. I had never before experienced such beautiful thoughts of a man, though he is very humble. He would be feared if anyone came up against him. At that thought, his eyes flashed in true majesty, buried out my thought. There was a middle-aged woman waiting on the corner facing east, probably waiting for a bus, whom I noticed observing him with a beautiful expression on her face. She was probably experiencing the same beautiful spirit coming from the Savior I believe he was. There was a calmness in his expression and walk, and a calm, peaceful feeling I felt in looking at him. He turned north on State Street as I hurried the car around the block in hopes of seeing him again, but I couldn't find him. My next stop was a cafe where I was to meet a salesman I sold vacuum cleaners with. The spirit of the Savior was with me as I sat waiting, and I was looking at the waitresses with a feeling of charity. 
My thoughts were how much more they ex were exposed to the pressures of the hard life than the average girls, and the Savior felt like a big protected brother to them. There was no self-righteous bigot in him at all, so common in some types of church-going people. I thought if ever I see the same man again, I would use some excuse to talk to him. About three years later, between State and Main Streets on South Temple, as I was walking east on the north side of the street, I instantly recognized the man I had seen before, whom I believed was the Savior. This time, instead of being dressed in working man's clothes, he was dressed in what appeared to be new clothes, brown pants, brown sports jacket, brown shoes, and carrying a brown briefcase under his right arm, which looked new. This time he was walking fast. As I first looked at him, his eyes caught mine and gave me a beautiful, kind smile from his eyes. He was tall, slender, and broad-chested with broad shoulders. I felt as though I was passing a powerful giant. As I passed him, he looked away, and I noticed what I thought was a tired look in his eyes. The best I can describe was as one who hadn't slept, as though the weight of the world were on his shoulders. Though his appearance was very youthful, I had the thought, that he was the Father in Heaven's Son, whom God loved. It was obvious he was not a native of the United States, and can be, best be described as when one sees some men from the Middle East. I was headed for a visit with my father, who lived in the Gibbs apartment on the west side of the State Street between South Temple and Nome, almost to North Temple before it was torn down during this appearance. I was intending to visit my father, but almost... Immediately upon arriving there, I felt impressed to leave, although I didn't know then. On walking down State Street towards South Temple, the man I believe was a savior, whom I had seen a few moments before, was leaning against the corner post of the wall at the corner of South Temple and State Street. He was looking up the street at me, and for half a block or so, his eyes never left me. As I passed by him, his eyes were always directly on me, although I would look repeatedly away. Feeling too humble to approach him, as I had resolved to do as I crossed South Temple, I looked back and his eyes were always on me as far as I could see. Even halfway down to First South, looking back, his eyes never looked looking at me. I thought, oh, he is a savior. And I didn't have the boldness to stop and talk to him. The very beautiful spirit came over me and said, It is all right. Another interesting story regarding the three Nephites or possibly John the Revelator is the appearance of Robert Edge. There's another uh, version of this story. There's uh, two or three versions of it. This is one of the lesser known versions of the, of the story, the Juvenile Instructor. Uh, the Juvenile Instructor volume... 16 February 1st, 1881. It is entitled A Strange Personage. Occasionally, our missionaries, while traveling and preaching the gospel, encounter men and objects that, to the casual observer, are a matter of course. But to a careful student, they offer a field for study, as the following will illustrate. In May 1878, a man calling himself Robert Edge came into Lexington, Henderson County, Tennessee, preaching what he called the gospel after the apostolic order. His advent was as remarkable as his manner and teachings. The night he made his appearance there was a great noise, as of a terrible explosion, which was heard a distance of 35 miles. He was a man of ordinary appearance, small of stature, with red hair and pleasing address. He was well versed in scripture. In fact, the Bible was to him as a child's primer. He knew it all. He applied for the privilege to preach, and having obtained it, he preached the most remarkable sermon of modern times. He spoke of the apostasy from the primitive church and upon, and upon the apostolic order, and dwelt at some length upon the first principles of the gospel, more particularly upon that power of the Holy Ghost. He said he could not baptize, but the power to do so was upon the earth, and it would be revealed to them in due time. He proved conclusively by the 
Bible that the Roman Catholic Church is the mother of harlots, according to Robert Edge, that the churches of modern Christianity are daughters and granddaughters of her, and that their priesthood is false, and their members deluded. He said that all, all the secrets of masonry and all the secret combinations of man is now practiced are a base counterfeit and an abomination in the sight of the Lord. He called upon all men to come out of Babylon to forsake man-made doctrines and follow Christ, to assist in rolling forth the purposes of God and prepare for the great millennium soon to be ushered in when Christ will reign personally upon the earth. Many other things he also told that were so remarkable that people stood aghast and inquired of him further. He preached a series of sermons denouncing masonry, etc., and expounding the intricate parts of the scriptures. There was not a prophecy, but what he could explain as easily as if he had written it. And the first chapter of Ezekiel was to him as the alphabet. He organized a body of the church, as he said, by blessing and la the laying on of hands, and admonished his converts to be faithful and pray to God always who would reveal many great and important things to them that they should understand. He required them to fast three days in succession, after which he administered the Lord's Supper and informed them that they were not the only ones that were of this faith, but that he could not give them any further information upon this point. He instructed them that if any should persecute them for their doctrine, they should remove to the West. The people watched him closely, he lived as he taught them to, was abstemious in his habits, refraining from animal food of all kinds, and ate only cornbread and buttermilk. Many remarkable cases of healing occurred under his administration. He was asked if he was a Mormon, to which he replied, If I am a Mormon, God bless the Mormons. He intimated in talking to the people that when they had gone to the mountains of the west, he would again visit them. He said he had not authority to perform any of the ordinances pertaining to the church, but that the priesthood was upon the earth and his power would be made known to them. He said he had been preaching for 1,800 years. He remained with the people some time and explained a great many things to them that are not here mentioned. The people offered him money and clothes, but he positively refused to accept either. He was always forewarned of any danger that was about to happen to himself, and his disappearance was quite as mysterious as his advent. He has never been heard of since that in that region. A great many more very curious traits of character and remarkable sayings and teaching of this wonderful man might be here jotted down, but let this suffice. I leave my re readers to solve the question, who is he? The little band he organized have since been baptized and have emigrated to Colorado and are faithful and true to this great Latter-day work. There's more information on Robert Edge and other presentations. One of them, you can search here, one of the three Nephites, Robert Edge. That's on YouTube. This concludes this video. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe.